break. We're back now, and uh, the panel, the next speaker is Ben Kalos. Good evening. Our city's charter is in desperate need of an upgrade for the next generation. The last telegram was sent in 2006, so I don't think the charter should require telegraph to be maintained by the NYPD commissioner. The minimum wage is about to be $15 an hour, and I don't think that the mayor's fourth enumerated power should be to pay election workers only $20 a day. We're presented with an opportunity to examine the balance of powers, the infrastructure of our government, and ultimately who is empowered to make decisions on behalf of 8.7 million people who call the city home. Since August, I have carried a copy of the charter around with me, highlighting interesting sections and soliciting input. I must admit that I haven't read all the way through to section 3103 of the charter. My testimony, though, does represent a best effort through a cursory view identifying challenge, challenges with the proposed solutions as a starting point. I joined hundreds of New Yorkers in participating in the Mayor's Charter Revision Commission by testifying over several months in favor of items now on the ballot, including term limits and urban planners for community boards, and a slate of campaign finance reforms to reduce large contributions and match more small dollars with more public dollars to finally get big money out of New York City politics. First and foremost, I would ask that if these measures pass, this commission not weaken them in any way. And in fact, I'm asking you to strengthen them by adding a requirement that any part of the charter adopted through a vote of the people only be subject to change by those same people at another vote. Along those lines, there are certain reforms that must be protected from future change without a vote of the people, such as ethics reforms for a lifetime ban on lobbying and lifetime term limits for elected officials, and enshrine reforms in the city council to make the job full time, eliminate Lulu's for equal compensation and standardize budget allocations for each council member. In the face of an attack on our rights from the federal government, New York City is in need of its own Bill of Rights, guaranteeing residents a right to free higher education and child care, affordable health and mental health care, access to parks, libraries, and public transit, affordable internet, freedom from hunger, clean air and water, just to name a few. This commission can create a pathway for all the residents with great ideas for laws at these hearings and in the future to submit bills directly to the city council for a guaranteed hearing and vote. Ultimately, the 1989 Charter Revision Commission gave many of the powers from the Board of Estimate to the mayor and boards appointed by the mayor. Regardless of the mayor, other elected officials and communities have often been without power to stop or wrong. My recommendations hope to democratize many of the city's most powerful boards with appointments from the borough presidents and council to achieve fair housing and affordable housing goals. Borough presidents and community boards must be empowered to veto bad rezonings. The council empowered with a final vote on franchises that have left residents without reliable cable or internet and both empowered to initiate land use changes in their own right. I would highlight for this commission three main themes. My testimony is 30 pages. Please enjoy reading. <laughs> Thank you very much, Council Member. Uh, Commissioner Fiella has a question for you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Council Member, I want to uh, thank you for uh, being with us tonight, and we look forward to the extensive supplemental material you're providing on behalf of your colleagues. I want to ask you a question about a subject that uh, you took up four or five, six years ago. I don't know the exact date, but I read a report. Uh, you provided some oversight hearings and held uh, an extensive uh, series of discussions regarding the community boards. I read that report years back. I got to pull it out and find it. The question I have is because the, uh, this is my third charter commission. And I can tell you from 1989 forward, community boards, community boards, community boards. The subject comes up every time. What you find when you listen is some community boards operate and seem to have tremendous influence utilizing the existing language in the charter. So that supports the notion that there's sufficient language as exists that allows community boards to have a meaningful voice and then a lot of them say I need this I need this I need this which then leads you to conclude there's a deficiency in the language as it presently exists you did that extensive analysis is there any intention to do a follow-up and see what or what percentage of community boards have adopted the measures that came out of that task force effort 
and to see whether or not we really need the charter to be beefed up or do we need the community boards to gain a better understanding and insight into the existing language and utilize the tools that are already available to them in the charter. And great work on that report, by the way. I read it from cover to cover. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> it, is, it is very rare for elected officials to hear anyone actually reads any of the things we write. That report was about 80 pages, and it collected a lot of the best practices from every borough, including your great borough of Staten Island, uh, where your borough president does not appoint people with political affiliations, which I think is a best practice. I like to tell folks that when a community board, a council member, and their borough president are aligned, there is very little that can stop them. Uh, that is likely because in many cases involving land use, the council member has the final vote. Uh, when you have a situation where there is not an alignment between the community board, borough president, and the council member, uh, one awful, often sees that the borough president may be misaligned or the council member may be misaligned, in which case you end up with a situation where the community board's voice goes unheard. That's why I'd like to add one more step to the process, which is if you have a community board say, I, I want them to be able to say, we have a problem with this, and if the borough president says I have a problem with this, they could bring it to the borough board and if all three of them agree, they might be able to say, hold on. And just as negotiations go, not to tell too much of the secret sauce to some of the people at this table among the commission who actually have been involved in more land use actions than I will ever be <laughs> involved in for my entire life, if you are dealing with people at the table who have a vote, the negotiation is going to go much differently. And I believe that if the City Planning Commission, which I would hope to reconstitute with a voice from the council, had knew that the community board's vote had a binding impact, and if they didn't make the community board and borough president happy, they risked going before a borough board that might stop their project, then you would have a City Planning Commission that was more responsive to community board concerns. So I assume then that uh, in forthcoming in the material, we might find something regarding binding authority relative to the community board's role in our city. Uh, page 20. <laughs> what was that? On page 20. Page, thanks. Thank you so much, Council. Thank you. Paula? Being one of the many people who have read the charter, um, thank you for that. <laughs> uh, I wanted to ask a question about whether you thought there'd be any value to just streamlining the structure of the charter so that more residents would get engaged in our city. Thank you for reading the charter. I am very happy with the commissioners who are been selected, uh, that all the nerds in government have been attracted to the right place. I. Uh, found many places like the Telegraph and the uh, Board of Elections where I feel that we should slim down the charter so it is not necessarily 360 pages if printed from the city's website and pull a lot of the things that don't need to be there out and put it into the administrative code. I think there's a lot that's in the administrative code that could be pulled out and put into rules and regulations and we could have a document that could be a lot more accessible, a lot more like our Constitution. One of the items I'm suggesting is a Bill of Rights, and that could actually help guide our principles and values, and so instead of somebody having to find Charter Section 435B, they could say, no, on, on Section 1 where the Bill of Rights is that says that there's a right to access to my government and, and you're violating that right, please fix it. Thank you. I agree. Sal? Uh, Councilmember, good evening. Good evening. Uh, I'd like to commend you first for the work you've done on, on, on the Charter uh, and your suggestions. Very thorough, good work, a lot of very solid ideas. Um, and in terms of campaign finance reform, um, sad to say, uh, the proposals that, are be, that will be on the ballot um, in my opinion, won't do much to keep conflicted money out of our politics. Um, it basically still, people running for citywide office will still be reaching out 
to depocketed sources in the city. Um, people in, in working class communities, some of the poor communities are going to be unfortunately left out of the process. Um, lobbyists and developers and their families can still bundle money. So I know you and I have had a discussion about what I consider the gold standard in campaign finance, which is the Seattle Democracy Voucher Program. I was wondering why you didn't include that in your proposals. Thank you for your advocacy for democracy vouchers. It is something that I hope to work with you, not in this role, but in a different role as a, a strong advocate and, and former elected yourself to pass legislation on that that could be done outside of the charter if this commission chooses to start enshrining certain items like democracy vouchers from being changed by elected officials through a political process. I'd be interested in doing that as well. And, and, and you're right. If the current system only gives candidates a little more than half of the money they need to run. Uh, and right now, I believe, for the mayor's office, that is uh, $2.6 uh, million. Under the new system, it would be a little over a million. Uh, and, and you're correct. A million dollars is still a, a god-awful amount of money that, that shouldn't be there. We got from 55 to 75 percent. If we could get to 85 percent, it would mean that you wouldn't actually need to raise any dollars larger than 250. That being said, I, I like to say to folks, I, I've never, you can currently give the mayor $5,100 or any citywide official. I've never given anyone something worth that much. I, I gave one person something worth that much and I expected her to spend the rest of her life with me. She said yes, uh, but money has expectations. And so some of my colleagues from who represent low-income communities of color have said to me, no, one, no one's writing me a check from my neighborhood for $250. We need democracy vouchers and, and I agree. And the reason it is not in this testimony, to be frank and honest, it was in my initial testimony to the Mayor's Charter Revision Commission and based on the direction that they were going between June and July, we ended up dropping it and focusing on the direction they were going. And we pulled many of the recommendations that we're giving you from that same report. It's an oversight, and at the next hearing, I hope to include it. So you're open, you're open to I want to introduce the legislation and get it passed, and I'm interested in making it a, a, an elected official proof uh, item enshrined in the charter.